have your mothers who live more than 500 miles away. The rest of you are very lucky. Very, very lucky. Because most people today don't. And so they really don't have anyone to turn to. And women who are in the workforce are coming home from work when they're so tired and they're picking their children up at daycare when their children are tired. They're having um, much smaller families. And so they really don't have anything to tell them. Um, and what most mothers really want to know, is this normal? Or is this, is this a phase? Are they going to grow out of it? Or are they going to end up in Deer Lodge? You know, we, we need to know. Kind of so that, <coughs> because quite frankly, a lot of times when you're going through one of those phases, you think it will never end, don't you? You just think this will be forever. I will be changing diapers until I'm 72. It will never end. And, and so what I wanted to develop was something that was very light and non-guilt producing. Just some ideas and some techniques and some things that are gleaned not only from our family and our experience of our children and the children that they brought home with them, but also the experiences from other parents and families that were very successful. And my mother always kept a spotless house. And, and that, to her, the sign of a good woman was that you could eat off the kitchen floor. I mean, who would want to? But you could have if you would have wanted to. And that you always had food enough to feed an army in case an army came by. But what happened was she had the house so clean, but she didn't teach me how to get it there. Because she used a phrase that I think every mother in the world has used, do you know what? I, it's easier for me just to do it myself than it is to take time to teach you. Uh, why don't you run outside or why don't you run and do that? Have any of us ever used that? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, I, it's, a, it's a real um, easy thing to come to. What happened as I grew up and married and moved away, Duane was in the Air Force, a career officer, and so we traveled a lot. What happened is that in my mind was the vision of the clean house, but I didn't know how to get there. And so it was so frustrating because I'd work here for a little while, and have you ever done that? You go down to put a load of clothes in and then you think, oh, I better take something out for dinner. Then you run up and take something out for dinner. Oh, well, I might as well go clean the closets. And, and at the end of the day, you're like, oh. because you don't know how to do it in a systematic way. And it always creates this kind of frustration because you don't know um, how to achieve the goal that she has given you. She hasn't, she hasn't given you steps along the way. Well, one of the things that, that I've told you is that I wanted, to, I wanted to find some way to reach young parents to tell them ab about having fun with their kids and having a fun family life. The other reason I wrote the book is a purely selfish one, and it's because I am in business. And uh, we have owned businesses before. And I have to tell you that the workforce that is coming out of America today is terrible. And let me tell you, when your child gets 25 and goes in to apply for a job and says things like, uh, well, listen, I, I, don't, I don't really like to do, I don't really like people. I mean, I don't, I don't got, I mean, I, I mean um, and I'm thinking, you graduate in the top of your class? This is scary, really scary. So um, what I'm, I'm going to ask you to do as we go through this process and as you go through the next weeks and months and years is that you focus not on the 10-year-old, but that you focus on the 25-year-old who is sitting in front of a potential employer. And, and I am not kidding you. Those people who have a work ethic and who can assume personal responsibility shine like a beacon. They just stand out. It's, uh, it doesn't matter what their degrees are. When you find one that can work, they can name their own ticket. 
because they're so few and so far behind. Uh, there are four A's that we want to approach this with. Attitude. Make it fun and don't give up. How many times have you thought, it's not worth it? How many of you read Ann Landers the other day? There was a, a little thing in there about a woman who's pregnant going through the checkout stand. The little two-year-old says, I want a candy bar. She says, no, I want a candy bar. No, I want a candy bar. No, Donk. just take the candy bar. And the guy is, is writing to say, no wonder America's going to hell in a handbasket. And part of me agreed with him and said, I, I, I see it every day. The other part of me remembered being pregnant with a two-year-old, <laughs> thinking, I, do you know, I've, we've got to deal with this. We have got to deal with this. But right now, I am this close to tears. You haven't had a nap. If, if I go in to Dr. Spock right now, it, it's never going to work. Just take the candy bar, fill your mouth. We get home, we'll both take a nap, and we'll start over again which is not a solution, but that's what most of us do when we're, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, survival. it is survival. It is survival. And sometimes that's what we have to do because you're not rational at that point <laughs> to have this long discussion on why sugar's bad for your teeth, why the budget is only this much, why this and that. All they want is the candy bar and all you want is for them to be quiet for just five minutes until you get the groceries in the car, get home. So it's real interesting. But the attitude, attitude, make it fun and never give up. Uh, if, it, if it doesn't work this week, then start over again tomorrow. And, and if this job chart doesn't work, one of the things that I found is that any job chart or job jar or whatever I've used is only good for about two weeks anyway. You need, you need to keep revamping. You need to keep redoing things. In the first place, your kids aren't the same as they were two weeks ago. They've grown, they've developed, they've, they have different um, needs in their life. Maybe they're in, huh? <laughs> they're not kissing up that week. <laughs> That's right. They don't want to go to a dance. That's right. Whatever it is. But you need to keep doing new things all the time. <clears throat> Second thing is aptitude. It's very important that you teach them how to do things. Just like my mother not teaching me how to get a clean house, I was continually frustrated because I didn't know the process. I knew what it should look like at the end, but I didn't know how to get there. So it's important that you teach them the aptitude. Um, but when we're doing that, just like when we were talking about before, we're not going to focus on the 10-year-old. We're going to focus on the 25-year-old. It's not getting the family room clean that you're going to teach him. It is problem solving skills. It's life skills. It's learn learning to look at situations in different and varied ways so that he can use those skills in something else. And those are called life skills. Those are things that we need to do to get through life, every one of us. The next thing is attention. We need to focus on our child's future rather than on the dirt. And for everything a child does wrong, do you realize they do 19 things right? And we forget that. It's, uh, how many of us are working mothers? Okay. Sometimes uh, when we come home from work and, and we've been going like this all day long, and we come in, and the kids have been home for an hour, and they're having an apple in the living room, and their feet are up on the sofa, and uh, you know the TV's on. Is that a hard adjustment for nobody else? I'm the only one. <laughs> yeah, it's it is hard, isn't it? It's real hard. One of the the things that I have to struggle with is forgetting that there's a difference between leisure and lazy. Because in my mind, if they're moving then they're, uh, they're doing what they should be. If they're resting, then they must be lazy. And I've, I've had to work a long time to recognize that it's good to relax. And it, it's right. They have earned that right to relax. Appreciate and acknowledge. Success breeds success. And all too often, all of us uh, forget to acknowledge what we have done right. We're very easy to say what we've done wrong we're very easy to say what our weaknesses are, 
but we forget how many things we are succeeding at. And we need to teach our children to acknowledge their own success so that they recognize what, they, what they're doing that's right and what it is that um, will help them. Dorothy Briggs has said, helping children build high self-esteem is the key to successful parenting. Do you believe that? Well, you three ladies that work in PTA, you certainly must see that. The kids who have high self-esteem are involved in more things, they get better grades, they feel better about themselves. They feel stronger if there is a lesson that they don't understand that they say, Mrs. McIntosh, I don't get that. Could you go over that again? Or um, they say to a bully on the playground, hey, I don't like that. That doesn't make me feel comfortable or that makes me feel uncomfortable. Kids who have <coughs> high self-esteem just have a much easier way through life. The three things that are the most precious gifts that you can give your children as a sense of who they are and their self-esteem, teaching them how to write written goals and to learn how to read. Do you know if they have those three things, there isn't anything that they can't conquer. There really isn't. There's anything they can't overcome, anything that they can't do. If they feel good about themselves, they'll ask questions. And they'll seek out help for whatever they need. Self-esteem has two major components. And I think that it's interesting to learn this because we always think uh, self-esteem is almost a little buzzword, isn't it? You know, I mean, everybody's using self-esteem. There are two parts of it. Self-efficacy. Does anyone know what this means? It's, it's hard, isn't it? I, uh, took me forever just to learn how to say efficacy. Yeah. <laughs> it looks like it's really efficient or, or I hate mm. something. It does. Well, what what it does is efficacy is the ability to learn. It means we have the ability to learn, we have the ability to choose, we have the ability to make appropriate decisions. So this is our ability. Self-respect is the confidence. This means that we have the confidence in our right to be happy. How many people do you know who, honest to goodness, don't feel like they have the right to be happy? They don't feel worthy of their joys or worthy of something. And almost set up another workshop that I do that you may want to look for in the community that's very good is called self-sabotage. It's an excellent one because so many of us set up our own road roadblocks because we don't feel like we need it. Uh, the thing about having positive self-esteem is that it's a basic human need. Just as basic as breathing or eating or going to the bathroom, there is a hunger for us to achieve our full potential. There's a hunger that's in there that wants us to be the best that we can be. And it's just as essential to you as, um, as air is. One of the main ways that you can give your children that foundation is by having a family time every week. And this is one of the ways that, that we can invo involve a spouse because it's not easy. But how many of you have ever read this book, Back to the Family? It's one that um, a psychologist <clears throat> did and what he did was he interviewed the best teachers in all 50 states for two years and he asked them to recommend families that they considered successful. So he had 100 successful families to draw from. And it was real interesting as he interviewed them and they certainly came from different areas. They came from, uh, you know, there were doctors and lawyers and Indian chiefs and single mothers and a Russian family who spoke no English. There was every family under the sun. The only criteria was that they had to have been parenting for at least 10 years so, they, so that they had some experience because everyone's a great parent of a six-month-old. 
I mean, right? I mean, what can, what can we do wrong? They just, they smile and forgive us and for all of our sins. But, but it was real interesting as he went through these families that there were some things that came out that all of the successful families did. One of them was that they had a time that was theirs. They had a family time, and, and psychologists, some will call it a round table, some will call it a uh, team building, some will call it our time, but there was some period of time where they interacted just with themselves. And quite frankly, it's the only time that you have to teach your children. Because one of the statistics that I uh, mentioned in here was by a Dr. Stephen Glenn that talks about how, let's see if I can find it here real quick, what it comes, it comes down to is a 10 year old in a family of two parents has 14 and a half minutes of direct interaction with those parents on a daily basis. Of that 14 and a half minutes, 12 is spent correcting, threatening, giving orders, or telling them what to do. That means two and a half minutes of positive interaction with them. And it said, um, Louis Sullivan, uh, Secretary of the Health and Human Services, said families spend only 17 hours a week of awake time together. That's a 40% drop from 1965. Even though part of that time you may be physically together watching television, <clears throat> that does not necessarily constitute quality time. During quality time, family members are concentrating their attention on one another and other activities are screened out. Anything that your family does to establish traditions and patterns of togetherness will help the children and the adults all feel more of a team. Anything that you do. And there was a wonderful article in Reader's Digest, and I'm just sick that I did not cut it out because I can't remember the exact title of it. And do, you, and do you know how that is? And you can't ask for reprints unless you have exactly the title. It's like asking directory for something. You, you have to know whether it starts with the or whatever. They can't give it to you. But in the article, it came out like in August or September or something, talked about um, kids in high schools who were achievers. And it found that the happiest kids, the highest achievers, had dinner four times a week with their family. There was nothing else. There was not one other thing that, that made them, I, there wasn't, I mean, there wasn't any other condition that every one of the people had, except that they ate at least four times together. Now, I don't know about you, but tonight Faith had soccer, and so she came home from school, grabbed a burrito or something, and went, went to soccer. We came over here, grabbed something here. Andy came home from soccer. He's probably at home eating a can of chili. I, I mean, that's, uh, that's how life is. So in order to make time, you have to practically calendar it. You really do. And so many of the psychologists are saying that these times together are so, so vital. It makes a difference, and I wish that, let me see if I could, okay, statistics from the former U.S. Department of Health, Education, and Welfare indicate that by holding a regular family gathering for one hour a week, and you know what, we have lots of friends who do it in, for 20 minutes which is, and, and with young kids, 15 minutes uh, is more than enough. By holding a regular family gathering one hour a week, you reduce the probability of your child having serious problems with delinquency, alcohol, and drugs by up to 42%. You need to have an agenda, uh, whether it's even if it's just up here. You need to decide what it is you want to teach them. Because the thing you've got to remember is you are a teacher. You are not a boss. You're a teacher. We're going to teach them to become contributing human beings. We are not a boss. So we need to have an agenda. We need to have something in our mind that we want to accomplish. And um, the same time, the same place. 
One of the things that's very effective as we get into job charts and ideas on how to get your kids to work is if they know that the family will get together. Maybe it's Sunday dinner. Maybe they know that at Sunday dinner you linger after dinner to visit. That that will be judgment day. So that, and I don't mean that you're going to argue at the table at all. That means that Sunday at 4 o'clock, whatever chores you have been assigned have to be done. Because then the job chart changes. And so if they put it off until Sunday at 3 o'clock, that's not your business. Because it's their job. They are doing it. As long as they know that there are some timelines. But if you have a regular family gathering at, at the same time, then they will kind of know that there will be, a, there will be like a reporting time or, or some, something that will be a cutoff. No interruptions. Absolutely no interruptions. Just like your family, they don't go out, they turn the phone off. That's their time. It's interesting as our children have grown and matured, and, and um, the, for those of you who have small children, I have to tell you, the very, very best part of parenting is having adult children. It, they, it is wonderful. They have turned out to be kind and gentle and intelligent and wonderful people. And I just, it, it's like a reward, isn't it, Dwayne? It's just great to see them develop into the kind of people you would have picked from a, a catalog if you could have done. But when you, uh, as we visit with them and we talk about the things that they remember, I, I mean, we sacrificed to take them all to Disneyland. And it was a major sacrifice, save for a year. In talking to our adult children, what do you remember? It was campouts in the backyard. It was playing Uno on the, on the dining room table. It was playing spoons on the dining room table. Things that didn't cost a cent. It was root beer floats. You know, it was ordering pizza when they came home from dates. Very, very simple, inexpensive things. The next thing that's very important in um, this family time is that everyone gets to speak. Now, now you have a, five years between yours, okay? And what are you, how old are your children? I have a, an eight-year-old and a thirteen-year-old, and then a retarded sixteen-year-old. Okay. So which is it? which is very yeah. It's something because that's something we're going to talk about too, because. Even if he weren't retarded, you may have an eight-year-old that acts like a four-year-old or an eight-year-old who is mature enough to be 16. But they still, are, they still need to be included in that family time. So what we did in our family, um, it just so happened that the genes were about evenly distributed and we had three very strong, forceful, um, very quick, quick-tongued, uh, and then three very shy. So if we let those who were very quick on their feet speak uh, all the time, uh, the others never got a chance to voice their opinion or to say what they needed to have said. And their voice was every bit as valuable and as important as the others. So we developed a thing called the Kleenex box. It's not a thing. How's that for scientific? We developed a thing. But a technique. <coughs> That's better. A technique. The Kleenex box, and we didn't allow criticism, and we didn't allow uh, tempers, and we didn't allow name calling. But with the Kleenex box, whoever had the Kleenex box had the power. And that person could talk until he or she were finished talking. And no one could say, yeah, but, yeah, but, and you know, because it's too easy when you have a house full of teenagers for one or two to dominate. Have you had that experience, anyone? So when they had the Kleenex box, then they were allowed to give it to someone else. And then that person could talk. And it was amazing. I know uh, when I um, taught this class up at Child Care Resources, the, one, the parenting one that was here a few months ago. Anybody go to that one? Excellent one. Well, uh, Nancy Schmalek, I think, was the woman's name. And she said, well, how do you keep one from filibustering? Do you know, and that happens maybe once or twice. 
but then you develop a respect for one another and and you want to be treated the same way and so it is passed around and everyone gets an equal voice gets a, a chance to participate in that no criticizing no embarrassment and no putting people on the spot because that's not fair if parents need to work with a child you work with them in private and then you may say to them hey Sally this is uh, this is a real tough problem how about if we brainstorm and get the whole family get some ideas from the whole family would you mind because if she would mind then you don't do it because no one including her siblings should need to know personal personal private things that she doesn't want to share use I statements <clears throat> very important as you're working with your children when you start out saying you are such a slob or you never finish the dishes you left the bathroom in a mess immediately the defenses go up if you can say I feel um, frustrated when I come home from work and there are clothes all over the living room I feel angry that there are th this and that what can we do to solve the problem because then you're working as a team and you're saying let's all work together let's all see there's there's a problem all right but I'm not gonna lay it all on your footsteps let's let's solve it together let's find a solution and that really does make a difference the other thing that's really important is to never shout have you noticed that when you have an and face going yeah right <laughs> I'm not talking about normal every day I'm talking about in a family <laughs> yeah, in a in a family group because if you shout what happens is the children become what I'm out of here that's right they turn you off and they also this is some what you want to do is make this a fun time <laughs> something that they will remember and if you spend that time criticizing and griping and whining and telling them all of their woes quite frankly the minute they get a little uh, little bit of money in their pocket and um, a set of wheels they won't come because they don't have to so you've got to make it fun respect their privacy take turns being in charge um, how many of you have ever had kids in 4-H wonderful program isn't it and they have to do things or Girl Scouts you know how they earn badges Boy Scouts those are things that they could present to the family and you need to learn to do those kind of things in a safe environment um, one of the things that that we have done and, and that some other friends have done that have worked out very well is um, say they want a prom dress that's over and above the budget that you've given them you want something done that you would be willing to pay someone for and so you say to them well uh, I can either advance you the money and we can do a contract that you will get this done or you negotiate with me you get your ducks in a row you come to me and you tell me how you will do it well that's much safer for them to sit down with a parent who loves them and say look these are the reasons why I need it and this is what I need and this is how I do it when they do that with you a couple of times what do you think happens when they're in the workplace and they need a raise see they have then they have those skills they have those life skills they think all right now before I go into him I gotta get my ducks in a row I've got to have an objective I've got to know how I can present this in such a way that I'll get what I want these are negotiation skills those are things that are going to carry with them for the rest of their lives when you're in this family council or this family time and and one of the things that come up is home maintenance because we live in the home and that's what we have to have is we have to maintain that home we need to establish the standards and we need to come to some decisions on what do we want for the family now what usually happens if you're voting as a group is that the mother has to lower her standards a little because quite frankly none of them think it's nearly as important as you do 
because no matter how much money we make in the workplace, no matter how liberal we are, in the back of our mind, that house is ours. And we're in charge of it. And if it looks like a pigsty, we're failing. And so in order to, um, in, uh, yeah, I know, I wish we didn't feel that way. Believe me, I wish we didn't. But in order to work out, um, work out what you need for a family, because what, what are the standards in my house would be way too lax for your house. Or, do you know, there's just, oh, no. <laughs> but, you know, we each, have di we each have different standards. We each have different things. The three things we decided for us was that the house had to be comfortable, it had to be inviting, and it had to be warm. And by comfortable, that means that not only are they comfortable coming home, but they are comfortable bringing their friends there. That it's a, a, and, and they feel good about inviting people. That when somebody knocks on the door, we don't have to say, ah, hurry, 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 hide everything. You know, it's Kirby salesman. Because uh, isn't it a shame that so many women, women worry more about the Kirby salesman than they do their kids? Hurry, ah, hide everything before the Kirby salesman sees how awful we are. And, and, which, and the value and your living room with magazines in it or whatever has absolutely nothing to do with your value as a human being. Believe me, I'm telling you that. It was a hard lesson for me to learn because my mother's house, I, God could have walked in and been impressed, but, but not in my house, not in my house. Well, one of the things that we did in our family was we decided that our kids are very involved in sports and we've always owned a couple of businesses and and been very involved in the community and we go to everything our kids are in, in sports so we decided that we would pay to have it done that we would give up cable television and pay to have it done and we have not had a housekeeper for about four months and you can tell it you can really tell it because we can keep it kind of picked up but we're busy people. We don't have time to deep clean, and so somehow we've got to work our budget so that we can have someone come in. It's much more important than cable television, believe me. But, but you have to decide in your own mind, what do you want? What do you want? What are your uh, expectations? When we're speaking about expectations, there's some real interesting things that happen. Uh, I see that families uh, go one of two ways. They either have very, very high expectations, expecting their children to be adults, or they have no expectations. And <clears throat> the no expectations comes from a lot of time from having worked very hard when they were children, <coughs> excuse me, and wanting life to be easier for them. If you, when your expectations are too high, what it does is it um, sets up discouragement. Discouragement means lacking the courage to try. And children want to please you. Have you noticed that? They really, really want you to be happy. They're happiest when you're happy. And they, <coughs> they want to be in a position that you'll be proud of them and, and be very grateful. And so right here, three-year-olds. We have a three-year-old. It has two pages of physical characteristics of a three-year-old. What they like to do, how to motivate a three-year-old. What, what their hot buttons are. And then it says uh, task expectations. Things that you could expect this three-year-old to do. Pick up toys, dress himself, clean his own plate from the table, clean the TV screen, dust with a feather duster, deliver items from one room to another, drop extra change into charity jars. Do you know all of these things that most three-year-olds could do, it would come back with, are you kidding? Oh, why, my child did that when she was six months. Or are you kidding? That's way too hard for a three-year-old. You should not expect, you've got to move this into the seven-year-old category. Do you, know, do you know what I mean? Every one of them, and, and we realized that it was too late to change that whole section, but the reality of it is, is each child is different. Each child is unique. And each family is unique. 
in here uh, like uh, for a uh, high school, a 15 to an 8-year-old, if 18-year-old, 15 to an 18-year-old. Okay, if this talks about what a, a 15 to an 8-year-old could do, that does not necessarily mean that your 15-year-old could. What it means that there's, there is something in there that you can work towards or that you can work on. I was in Tidyman's one day <coughs> and a man came up to me, very pleasant man, who said, my daughter hates your guts. I said, oh, well, that's unusual. I usually get along pretty well with children. Who is your daughter? <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, would you like some broccoli? Thank you for sharing that. <laughs> And he said, well, I bought your book, and I tore out what the 11-year-olds were supposed to do, and I put that up on the refrigerator, and I said, my God, she said you can do it, you can do it. <laughs> and I said, whoa, uh, you know, I, it's really a shame that you didn't read the front of the book, because it talks about teaching, and about teaching line upon line, and you just, uh, you know, you bring them up to that point. Because you can't expect a 10-year-old to do a 35-year-old job, and you can't expect a 10-year-old to do a 10-year-old job unless you taught him how. Just because this says that most high school students should be doing grocery shopping, should be able to check oil and fill a radiator, they can't do that unless somebody's worked with them. <laughs> you know, you can't just say, oh, all right, get out there and check that oil, <laughs> fill that radiator. Uh, you know, you've got, it's got to be a real gradual process. No, but do you know what happens when they're entering puberty? Honestly, it takes so much energy for them just to grow. And breathe. To breathe, it does. Their body is changing, their hormones are changing, their mind's changing, their emotions are changing. That sometimes, I, I don't think it's lazy, I think it's tired. I think it's just plain tired. That's also the period where they start um, being picky about food. Oh, that pork came from a, um, you know, I'm going to be a vegetarian, and I'm, you know, on and on and on. So, so they aren't always getting good nutrition, and they just are exhausted. I think that there are more and more kids, and there's a real difference. We were talking about this earlier between laziness and leisure. Okay, because I had a hard time with that. And it, it finally dawned on me that sometimes teenagers, because it, I couldn't figure out in the working world why those who were married and have children could get there at 8 o'clock. <laughs> and those who were younger, it was like, oh, 11 o'clock or, or 10 o'clock, you know. I mean, they would say, oh, I've been out making calls all morning. I'm thinking, hello, your hair's still wet. You know, I wasn't born yesterday, but I, I finally decided that a lot of that they're using in growing. They're they using that energy. Uh-uh. Uh no. No. You're, no, you don't have to. What you have to do in that family council is you need to say, okay, here are, here are some guidelines. You're on, um, Sally, you're on unloading the dishwasher every week. Or, or you're on unloading the dishwasher every day. It must be done by 7 o'clock at night. Or it must be done um, at 5 minutes to whatever time. Now, most people, this is what we figured out, was a, a real good balance. And see if this strikes too hard. Because what may be happening is that she feels overwhelmed. Okay, because it, it sounds like more than it really is. And, and don't we all do that? We think, oh, I've got to write that paper, I've got to write that paper, I've got to write that paper. You sit down and write the paper and it takes five minutes. <sighs> yeah, yeah. Well, what, what we came out with is that everyone should give a half hour a week to home, or a half hour a day to home maintenance. That's 15 minutes in the morning, 15 minutes at night. And then two hours on the weekend. That's not a lot. And if you can, if you can structure your job charts, maybe yours are a little bit more. You know, you you have a smaller child, don't you? So, so there tends to be a little more stuff there. Maybe yours needs to be 40 minutes a day. 
that's 20 minutes in the morning, 20 minutes at night. Anyone can do 20 minutes. In fact, you can do 20 minutes in an hour show just jumping up and down in the commercials and get your chores done. What, what they need to know is that they will be expected to have this done. And they can do it however they want to, whenever they want to, but as long as it's done. The, the real hard part is that we really want it done our way. So we found that there were a lot of fights over kitchens. Did anybody else find that? Mm -hmm. Because if whoever's cleaning the table will leave one teaspoon of peas if they have to, you know, because <laughs> they don't want to do it. So we found in our family, and, and it may not be in your family, that it was better to have one person do the kitchen. Do the kit. They loaded it, they unloaded it, they swept the floor, they wiped off the counters, they did the whole thing, rotated to someone else. And then they did it. Maybe if the only rotation is between you and your husband and your daughter. But, but have, be responsible for the whole thing. And then there isn't any, well, geez, I would have done if only this would have happened, if this would have happened. If they cannot get that done in the prescribed amount of time, then it's up to them to find a substitute or like, like Duane always says, when, when his job comes up for ironing, he always puts, or cause it to happen. <laughs> so that means that, <laughs> hey, however you get it done, you know, it may take $5 to the right person, but it will get done. So if she can't do it, or if she is unwilling, you don't want her to whine. What you want her to do is negotiate, is to say, um, look, I've got soccer practice. If you'll help me this time, then I'll do that. But you need to record that. The thing about having a job chart is that you're no longer the judge and jury. It's right here. And so you don't, um, you don't nag. But you know what we, what we need to go back to, clear back, remember when we were first talking of what do we really want? You know, maybe, maybe what we want is Donna Reed. Maybe what our family's capable of right now is the Adams family. <laughs> and, we, and we have to say, that's okay. That's okay, because at some point, at some point, maybe we can do that. Or quite frankly, what happens at some point, you think, what did I ever want Donna Reed for? What's it? You know, that, it's not that important. One of the things that's the most important is natural and logical consequences. This is, uh, anyone know what the word discipline comes from? Disciple. What does disciple mean? It's a teacher, a teacher, a follower of a great teacher. If we're, when we're discipline, disciplining our children, we're teaching them. And in order to have a lesson that sinks in, it has to have a consequence. <coughs> and we were talking about that a while ago, of, uh, of, of how, what are the consequences if this isn't done? Or what are the rewards? If it's done by thus and such a time, what do you get? What's the, what's the end result? Very important that you, that you spend that time with your kids so that you know what their hot button is. So <clears throat> one of, like I say, one of the reasons that I wrote this was selfish because I want to see the people who are coming into the workforce of America to be better trained. And they are not getting that in college. And they are not getting it at, in karate classes. They have got to get it at home. And it's amazing to me that you and I will drive clear across town to te give our kids karate lessons, or piano lessons, or violin lessons. And those are things that make our children well-rounded, and make them interesting, and make them fun to be with. But that's not necessarily something that they will be doing for the rest of their life. What, what we don't do is we don't take time to teach them, excuse me, to cooperate and to give service and to do the kind of things that make this a better world. So <clears throat> one of, like I say, one of the reasons that I wrote this was selfish because I want to see the people 
who are coming into the workforce of America to be better trained. And they are not getting that in college. And they are not getting it at, in karate classes. They have got to get it at home. And it's amazing to me that you and I will drive clear across town to te give our kids karate lessons or piano lessons or violin lessons. And those are things that make our children well-rounded and make them interesting and make them fun to be with. But that's not necessarily something that they will be doing for the rest of their life. What, what we don't do is we don't take time to teach them, excuse me, to cooperate and to give service and to do the kind of things that make this a better world. So um, what I'm, I'm going to ask you to do as we go through this process and as you go through the next weeks and months and years is that you focus not on the 10-year-old, but that you focus on the 25-year-old who is sitting in front of a potential employer. And, and I am not kidding you, those people who have a work ethic and who can assume personal responsibility shine like a beacon. They just stand out. It's, uh, it doesn't matter what their degrees are. When you find one that can work, they can name their own ticket. <laughs>